Before we bring up our guest of honor, I would like to thank Mike Montgomery of Cal Innovates and Tom Galvin of 463 Communications for their partnership and assistance on many levels. And I would also like to thank Ken King and Skadden for opening their doors to us this morning. A few words about Churchill Club for our new guests in the audience. Our nonprofit mission is to encourage innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. And we have been operating in the Bay Area here for 30 years this fall. We invite you to join us for future discussions, including the Smart Connected Home on July 27, drones on July 29, the U.S. Patent and Trade Office, Trademark Office uh, Chief Michelle Lee on, our, on July 30, AI Startups on August 26th, and the Churchills on September 24th. So you can see that we have quite a vibrant programming schedule. Uh, finally, if you tweet this morning, please use the hashtags Churchill Club and Cal Innovates, and you will find other Twitter codes in your programs. Right now, welcome FCC Commissioner Ajit Pai to address the audience. Thanks very much, Karen, uh, for the kind introduction. Thanks to the Churchill Club for uh, hosting this event. Uh, thanks to Skadden for the hospitality. And uh, thanks also to uh, Mike, Mike Montgomery and the entire team of Cal Innovates uh, for giving us a forum for a topic that is uh, quite timely, both in Washington, uh, the Bay Area, and everywhere in between. I thought I'd just start with a few remarks about uh, how I see uh, this marketplace developing, how the FCC's role might evolve. Uh, and I'd like to start 10 years ago. When uh, Java Kareem stood in front of the elephant exhibit at San Diego Zoo and was filmed uttering these mortal words. The cool thing about these guys is they have really, really, really long trunks. The resulting video entitled Me at the Zoo became the first ever video uploaded to YouTube, which could be profounded. And from my perspective, I'll confess, the fact that YouTube got its start with elephants rather than donkeys was a good omen of what was to come. Uh, but more seriously, me at the zoo ends with Kareem claiming, that's pretty much all there is to say. That certainly wasn't the case with internet video, as we all know. In the intervening decade, over-the-top video has dramatically reshaped the media landscape and redefined entertainment for the American people. While YouTube began with that 19th century <coughs> clip, today, 300 hours of video are uploaded each minute to that platform alone. Much of this content is personal. I routinely have posted pictures of my two children so that my family members from Australia to India can watch them immediately and as they grow up. Other YouTube videos are professional productions uh, with much broader appeal. Uh, for instance, DreamWorks Animation is now the majority owner of Awesomeness TV, a multi-channel network producing high-end content using characters like Shrek and Kung Fu Panda. Now, of course, user-generated platforms like YouTube are just one way that consumers watch online video. Uh, subscription video on demand companies like Netflix have revolutionized the video marketplace, giving birth to the phenomenon of binge watching, one which I have succumbed to quite often, including last night, I'm afraid to say. Uh, Netflix started its online streaming service back in 2007, and at the time, it was seen as somewhat of a sideshow to the DVD by mail business. But today, Netflix has 65.6 .6 million subscribers worldwide, and over 42 million of those are in the United States. That's far more than any cable or satellite company in this country. The company has also made a splash by producing a wide range of original content. Uh, from Orange is the New Black to Daredevil, uh, Netflix is now a quite serious competitor uh, to broadcast networks and to cable channels. And it's even getting into the feature film business. And needless to say, Netflix isn't alone. Other subscription services are creating original shows and movies, giving artists more outlets to share their work with audiences. Hulu has created popular TV shows like The Awesomes. A Curiosity Stream produces hundreds of hours of documentaries. And Amazon offers original programs like Transparent, Mozart in the Jungle, and Alpha House, a satirical political show that would have been even funnier if, instead of tracking four senators and their hijinks, it would have tracked four SEC, five SEC commissioners uh, laboring in the, in the Washington building we hadn't had. It. But for now, the SEC just has videos of its monthly meetings, which are riveting TV, and I highly recommend them when you have time. <laughs> now, the success of subscription video on demand platforms has uh, led broadcasters and cable companies to make standalone over the top plays as well. For example, consumers can now watch True Detective and Game of Thrones with HBO Now, 
where they can watch Homeland and Penny Dreadful on Showtime's standalone service that launched earlier this month. If you like classic TV shows such as Star Trek, or current hits such as The Big Bang Theory, or live local broadcasts, there's CBS All Access. And if you're in the mood for melodrama, Lifetime just began an on-demand subscription service featuring its movies. Now, beyond user-generated platforms and subscription on-demand services, many more business models are succeeding. Some services offer customers bundles of programming channels. PlayStation View, for example, carries over 80 networks, such as Fox, TBS, and Comedy Central. The Sling TV, offered by Dish, allows you to see about 75 channels, including ESPN, CNN, and AMC. And Spanish speakers uh, can subscribe to more than 50 channels through Yip TV for just $14.99 every month. Now, consumers can also purchase movies and television shows a la carte through services such as iTunes, Google Play, and MGo. And ad-supported on-demand services are increasingly becoming popular. Now, platforms like Crackle and Popcorn Flix allow consumers to watch over-the-top content for free. And what's interesting to me is that facilities-based video providers are feeling compelled to, and increasingly are, responding to this competition. For example, cable operators like Time Warner Cable are offering subscribers live TV and recent programs no matter where they are or which device they're using. Through its acquisition of AOL, Verizon hopes to create a thriving online, on-demand, ad-supported platform. And Comcast recently announced its Xfinity Stream service offering HBO and the major broadcast networks online for just $15 a month. Now, it's unclear which, if any, of these business models have the most long-term uh, potential. But what is clear, at least from my perspective as a consumer rather than a commissioner, is that the American consumer is the big winner. And the reason is that we've broken free from zoo-like constraints on our television viewing. For the first time in the history of video, we are in control. We watch what we want to watch, when we want to watch it, and on the device, and at the location, and over the platform of our choice. And indeed, according to a study released earlier this year by Pew Research, half of all smartphone owners, and 75% of those 18 to 29 years old, which fortunately excludes me by a little over a decade, uh, use their devices to watch videos during the course of a week. Today, 78% of all US adults use the internet to watch download or download videos. In order to meet demand, programmers have improved the quality of online content. Recently, Academy Award winner and Hollywood legend Dustin Hoffman said, right now television is the best that it's ever been. I think that's justified, and that's not just merely an endorsement of the FX's show, which I've enjoyed watching on Amazon. Now that raises the question, what has brought us, what has brought us to this golden age of television? And I would submit that it's a 21st century entrepreneurial spirit that isn't saddled with 20th century regulations. Without the burden of these legacy rules, entrepreneurs are able and have taken risks to deliver programming to consumers in ways that were unimaginable just a decade ago. And content creators have gotten creative, taking advantage of new opportunities to reach distinct audiences. And this is something that all of us should celebrate, whichever uh, perspective we take. But some of the nation's capital don't see it that way. You know, they look at the over-the-top video business, they see companies that have somehow escaped the regulatory clutches. Even though online video has thrived precisely because of the government's restrained approach, they view the internet as too important not to regulate. So they want to do for online video what many governments have done for, or more accurately to, Uber and Airbnb. In particular, you know, the FCC's leadership has announced that this fall, the agency will consider classifying certain online video providers as multi-channel video programming distributors, or MVPDs. Now, that term of art uh, comes from the 1992 Cable Act, and its meaning is as clunky and outdated as the term itself. And that meaning is essentially this. The FCC will regulate those online video providers like cable operators or satellite companies to treat PlayStation View like Comcast. Now, this morning, I'd like to make clear that I strongly oppose this proposal. Given the remarkable success of internet video, given that it's in its nascency, uh, the burden should be on those who favor new regulations to prove what's wrong and to explain why we should change. 
In my view, that case just hasn't been made. Amazon put it well when it told the FCC recently, there's been no indication that additional regulation is necessary to enable this new industry to grow and to bring consumers even more benefits. Now, to be sure, supporters of more regulation uh, paint a more benign picture. The FCC's rules, they claim, will assist online video providers. Or, to put it another way, we are from the federal government, and we are here to help. These words have sent shivers down the spines of generations of entrepreneurs, and over-the-top video providers, I believe, should feel the same way. Here's why. But to begin with, the benefits promised are illusory. For instance, some claim that additional FCC regulation would make it easier for online providers to carry television broadcast stations by obligating those stations to negotiate in good faith with online providers to reach what are known as retransmission consent agreements. But there's one big problem. Even with such agreements, over-the-top video providers still could not show broadcast programming unless they also had the copyright license to do so. Right now, cable operators have a legal right to getting that compulsory license. But that license only applies to cable systems. Now, the U.S. Copyright Office, better or worse, has taken the position that over-the-top video providers don't qualify. Now, some hope that the Copyright Office will change its mind, but I wouldn't bet on it. Now, to state the obvious, uh, the over-the-top provider with no physical distribution infrastructure is not viewed by that office as a cable system. And on top of that, the Copyright Office believes, and I'm quoting them, the internet market is thriving without st any statutory licensing in place. And so, notwithstanding yesterday's federal district court decision to the contrary, the Second Circuit has already endorsed the Copyright Office's view. And so the FCC's regulations would likely compel retransmission and consent negotiations that lead to the carriage of little or no programming. In English, these would be negotiations to nowhere. Now, the truth of the matter is this. Right now, nothing prevents broadcast programmers and over-the-top providers from negotiating carriage and licensing agreements. Indeed, plenty of broadcast programming is currently available online. To give just one example, PlayStation View already carries CBS, Fox, and NBC. But if programmers on the broadcast side don't want to give their content to particular online providers, unfortunately, there's nothing the FCC can do about it because copyright law stands in the way. Also, let's suppose that the tables were turned. Let's say that a broadcast programmer wants an over-the-top provider to carry its programming, but that provider has no interest in paying for it. Now, right now, that provider is free to say no and to simply walk away, no questions asked. But under the FCC's proposal, the government would require that online programmer to negotiate with the broadcaster over how much the provider should pay for that broadcaster's programming. And if they don't, they could be sanctioned by the government. Now, I fail to see how this would promote over-the-top video. And I don't think that over-the-top providers want this kind of regulatory help. Now, the only other benefit that pro-regulation advocates have mentioned is access to channels that are owned by cable companies. But here are some facts to keep in mind. But today, only 11% of program networks are affiliated with cable operators, and just three of the top 20 are controlled by cable. Moreover, over-the-top providers already have access to much of that programming. For instance, PlayStation View carries Bravo, CNBC, MSNBC, NBC Sports Network, and USA, all of which are owned by Comcast. Slink TV carries AMC and Wii TV, which are fully owned by Cablevision. As a result, all that the SEC's additional regulations would do would give over-the-top providers access to a few channels that are already available to them online. Now, stepping back and looking at the big picture, if the benefits are so minimal, then what exactly is motivating this push to regulate over-the-top video companies as if they were cable companies? Why try to fix what isn't broken? In my view, it's all about increasing the FCC's authority, about putting the FCC at the head of the digital table and bringing another industry within our reach. Now, today, the FCC's leadership says that it only wants to regulate certain online providers as MVPDs, those that provide multiple channels of linear programming. But once that camel's nose is under the tent, based upon my long experience in Washington, I'm confident that the body will soon follow, and that the FCC will seek to regulate other business models as well. And you can even predict one of the arguments that will be made. Why should we regulate some online providers uh, under these heavy-handed regulations, but not others? 
And so over the top innovators, I submit, should think long and hard about whether they really want the FCC as the regulator. For example, do you want the FCC telling you what programming you have to purchase and at what price? Because if the FCC regulates you as MVPDs, programmers will be able to file complaints at the commission about your decisions to refuse to carry programming, as well as the terms and carrier conditions of that carriage. Do you want the FCC to regulate the volume of the advertisements that you show? Do you want the FCC to regulate your employment practices? Do you want the FCC to impose greater closed captioning and video description requirements upon you? And that's not to mention some of the more arcane rules that apply, things like navigation devices, signal leakage, inside wiring, access to apartment buildings. It's unclear how those rules would apply in this space, but apply they would have to. Now, many in this industry understand the risks. For one, the Digital Media Association, which represents over-the-top providers, including Apple, Microsoft, and Sony, has told the FCC that excessive or ill-advised regulation at this point could deter continued investment. Tremendous developments in over-the-top services have emerged in an environment that permits innovators to be flexible and unencumbered. The addition of regulation could alter the foundation that has supported these developments and that has encouraged investment for continued growth. As a result, they believe the FCC's proposal, and I quote again, could end up backfiring, reducing resources and opportunities for these innovators rather than expanding them. Now, even supporters of the FCC's proposals see the risk. For example, Pluto, a linear streaming service, says, that certain of the SEC's regulations applicable to legacy MVPDs would unduly and unnecessarily burden companies seeking to enter, offer new and innovative services, thus deterring entry into and stifling success in the emerging market for online video services. And Pluto accordingly asks to be exempted from some of the regulatory burdens placed on MVPDs and only to receive what it perceives as the benefits of MV MVPD status. But the Communications Act doesn't let really you pick and choose which rules apply. Either you are an MVPD or you aren't. So for me, the way forward on over-the-top video from a regulatory perspective is simple. There is no market failure. There is no problem to be solved. And there is yet no need for the FCC to get involved and impose regulations that are over a decade older than me at the zoo. Just look at what's happened in the past month alone in the absence of government intervention. Hulu entered a partnership with uh, Showtime, reached an agreement for three more uh, seasons of South Park, and started streaming every episode of Seinfeld. Netflix announced the 2015 release dates for its first original feature films. Amazon reached a deal for programming for PBS's masterpiece uh, franchise. Verizon agreed with scripts <coughs> for HGTV, Food Network, and Travel Channel on its forthcoming wireless over-the-top subscription video service. Comcast jumped into this fray with the stream offer that I mentioned earlier. And Showtime and Lifetime launched new over-the-top subscription services. Just about every day, it seems, there's another market-driven, privately negotiated deal that benefits online providers, content creators, and, most importantly, consumers. This is a good thing, and it's all happened just in the last month. In some regards, the way this issue is playing out reminds me of the lyrics from the classic James Bond theme song, Goldfinger, uh, sung by the great Shirley Bassey. Like Goldfinger, the FCC is pouring golden words into the ears of over-the-top providers, uh, beckoning them to enter its web of sin, or in this case, regulation. Uh, but my advice to providers is the same as Dame Bassey's. Don't go in, uh, for you will soon find yourself ensnared in a web of regulations from which you'll never escape. Now, switching gears, uh, there's another emerging governmental threat to over-the-top video that I find troubling, and that is taxation. Uh, take the city of Chicago, which recently announced that, beginning in September, it will impose a 9% tax on video streaming services, on any services delivered electronically. Now, this new Netflix tax, as it's being called, it will apply not only to monthly subscription platforms, like Netflix and Hulu Plus, but also to all the part movie rentals through services such as iTunes. Who will bear the burden of this tax? Obviously, it's the people of Chicago. Netflix has already confirmed that it will pass the additional cost onto its subscribers. I'm sure that other companies will do the same. Here in California, by contrast, digital service, uh, streaming services aren't taxed. And in my view, that is the right approach. The government should welcome the growth of online video and not discourage it. 
It's the basic principle of economics that the more you tax something, the less you're going to get of it. And that's why, for example, Congress prohibits states and localities from taxing internet access through the Internet Tax Freedom Act. And that's why I'm pleased that a bipartisan group of lawmakers in Washington, including Senators John Thune and Ron Wyden, and Representatives Lamar Smith and Steve Cohen, have co-sponsored the Digital Goods and Services Tax Fairness Act. And this legislation would prevent localities from imposing duplicative and discriminatory taxes on digital goods and services, including over-the-top video. As Senator Thune put it, uh, the bill would help to ensure that the digital economy remains a source of innovation and economic vitality. Now, to this point, I've spoken about what government should not be doing. So you might wonder, is there anything the government should do to aid the growth of online video? And the answer to that question is yes. I've got to mention the one element that's critical to all the digital innovation that we see in the online video marketplace, and that is broadband infrastructure. Broadband, and a lot of it, is essential for online video to thrive. After all, those bits have to go over the top of something. We've been fortunate in this regard over the past two decades. Since 1996, companies have spent over $1.3 trillion in the United States to lay fiber, to upgrade cable systems, to launch satellites, to construct towers, and otherwise build the networks over which internet video travels. But there's a lot more to do. We want to fast forward, uh, to pull an outdated term forward, uh, just, uh, to pull out an outdated term. Our policies should encourage greater infrastructure investment and network capacity. And that means streamlining the permitting process for building wired and wireless infrastructure, a process that is especially difficult in many places. That means making available to the commercial marketplace plenty of additional spectrum, both cellular and Wi-Fi, to handle the surging demand for mobile video. That means changing FCC regulations to promote broadband deployment in rural America in order to connect and to grow the customer base for online video providers. That means allowing broadband providers to focus on building next generation networks rather than also requiring them to maintain the fading copper networks of yesterday. And that means lifting the obsolete economic regulations that were designed for the telephone monopolies of the past. In concert with a more forward-thinking view, we will make broadband more ubiquitous and more robust. And the more ubiquitous and more robust these high-speed networks become, the more creative online providers can be in meeting the demands of the video consumer. Now let me close with a, just a brief uh, personal observation. This past weekend, my wife and I struggled, but ultimately succeeded in getting the affirmation kids down to bed. So exhausted, I picked up my uh, laptop and I visited Crackle. And I caught up on a crackle with Jerry Seinfeld's fantastic show, Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee, including the episode featuring the unforgettable Miranda Sings, which I highly recommend to you. Now, aside from laughing throughout the entire episode, I mean, who wouldn't laugh when Miranda tries to advise Jerry on how to become famous, sir? Uh, I realized something. In a sense, Jerry and I had entered the digital age together. 20 years ago, I either organized my Thursday nights around NBC's Must See TV, or I programmed an analog VCR to be able to watch a comedic master of the domain on a virtually immovable big television. But now, Jerry could pick how to reach me and millions of other people. And I could easily pick when, where, and how to watch him. What a dramatic and positive change that is when you stop to think about it. And it's for this reason that I think the government should let the success story develop. Let's not treat over-the-top video companies as the next Uber or Airbnb, entrepreneurs that have to fight endlessly against regulations that are inspired by the past. Let's let innovators innovate, and consumers consume. And to borrow from Jawed Kareem a decade ago, that's pretty much all there is to say. Thanks again to the Churchill Club for uh, hosting us today, to Cal Innovates, to Scadden, and thanks to all of you for coming. I'd now like to welcome our panelists. Uh, including our moderator, Colin Dixon, who have uh, forgotten more about this space than I'll ever learn. Hopefully they'll inform you as to how I'm wrong, but hopefully why I might be right. But thanks very much. You are absolutely right about the forgotten stuff. It's forgotten most of it, I'm afraid, <laughs> at this age. So, um, I want to uh, kick off the discussion. I thought it would be good to sort of talk talk um, about the.
the content creation process and start with you, Kevin. Um, uh, you've, you've created some, some absolutely wonderful content like um, uh, Here is the <coughs> Dreams of Sushi. If you haven't seen that, it's on Netflix. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful documentary. Um, but one of the issues there with, with the content that you're, you're shepherding through that creative process is um, they're, they're, they're sold in multiple countries. Other countries do have regulations on video. So I'm wondering, do, do regulations from other countries impact you, and how do they impact you, or do they just simply never come up? Yeah. I think um, I think that there is this, uh, well, we'll to take one step back, you know, we, from a content creation perspective, it's almost, I wouldn't say irrelevant in terms of how regulation works, but that doesn't influence what we are or not doing, right? So what I think is great is, you know, to take some of the comments that you made about just sort of like the democratization of distribution, you know, from a content creation perspective, I think it's really put the pressure on us and our community to create better content. So if you're watching Jerry Seinfeld on Crackle, it's because of Jerry Seinfeld. Right, Crackle is nearly like this conduit to get to it and break this all this facility, but then the content creator unto itself has to be that much better because the demand is, because there's so much supply, that okay, what, what are we going to watch or not watch? So, here at Sushi, for example, which I'm very privileged to have been a part of, all driven by a filmmaker, I had no idea how that would or wouldn't work or cross over in the marketplace, but ultimately work because it was good content. So, I think that what happens sometimes is we get marred in this, this idea of technology and regulation, but from our perspective, um, and I'm curious to see where, where you guys sit, is that it's it's relevant only as it relates to once we get it made and completed, but in terms of actually influencing how it's made, we're just worried about making it good, if not great. So, but it's not just a question of being good, it's a question of being found, right? Um, now, we have a situation in the US where there are really four dominant SVOD players, um, if you're not on those players, can you be found? Oh, I think absolutely. I mean, I think, look, I think you know, if you look historically two, three, four years ago, YouTube decided, okay, we're this great platform, we're going to give out $100 million to all these content creators, you're going to make stuff, and because we're YouTube, and we have all this access, we're going to put it up and everybody's going to watch it. It was a completely failed experiment, right? So YouTube, one of the most ubiquitous um, platform for content consumption, you know, hundreds of hours every second. Um, and it failed um, in terms of the content consumption because it wasn't good. So I think with platforms and technology are realizing that it's not just so much the accessibility to the content as much as it's actually the quality. And now you look at what YouTube Zooming, they have an original content group. Um, you look at Snapchat, they've hired an executive from a television background to run original content. So, so I, I think that we, we sometimes put this idea of ubiquity and regulation in front of it, when the reality is from a, from a true content creation perspective, there, there is, a, there is a, an intention of quality that, that I think has to come first. So uh, what I'm hearing you saying is that you, you don't see um, any barriers in the distribution side of things. There are plenty of outlets for you to distribute your content and have it be found. Um, and obviously, don't want to see that change, right? Sure, and it certainly puts more, again, puts, what I like about it just puts more pressure on us to make better content, right? So, you know, consumers are going to be more satisfied, the, the economics, you know, will maybe sort of justify sort of like the diminishing returns on, you know, sort of this, this, you know, accessibility of content everywhere because there is an economic component to it. But um, I, I, I just think that the, the, the ability the content creator has now have to become has, has become much more entrepreneurial in how they're thinking about it, how they're distributing, how they're marketing it. So I don't think that you know Netflix, Amazon, these are if you're not up there, that these are gatekeepers that absolutely cannot get your content out there because th there is a ton of opportunity to distribute your content without needing these one, two, three, four gatekeepers, which frankly historically existed when we had you know three networks and and that's that's how you got your your show on the air. Indeed. Um, it, it seems like that, that that business model is pretty pretty irrelevant on the way, wouldn't you say? Yeah, in terms of um, meaning these gatekeepers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, you know, there's Gumroad, VHX, you know, I mean, YouTube and itself. Right? I can create my own economy <coughs> without the need of relying on you know sort of like this, this gatekeeping. Yeah. 
Uh, Dan, let me let me bring you into yeah. the conversation. Yeah, you, you've you've uh, been in a situation where you've created content in both mediums. You've created it in the regulated television industry. You've also created content in the wide open west of the of, of the web. Um, is there a big difference in, in in producing content and services in those different arenas? Yeah, there's a big difference. Uh, so I, I spent some time over at Disney, um, and then I was at Yahoo, and now doing my own uh, app. And I'd say, I mean, the primary difference is when you get companies like Disney and other large networks is that you, you typically you spend a lot of money developing this you know, quality content that'll live on broadcast and cable. Um, and really, it, it gets to that discoverability point. Um, you tend to spend a lot of money marketing that content. Um, and so even you know, Netflix has, has gotten into this in the last few years where uh, you know, the success of House of Cards, um, at least in, in LA where I live, there's billboards everywhere promoting the next season of those. So despite the fact that you know, they're spending that money and it's available online, I think that there's still that need in more of the traditional space to, to market and promote, um, which I think is interesting. And I agree with some of Kevin's points as well about the accessibility of putting content out there. I think the, the, the issues that I see still are um, discoverability to me is still an issue where it's easy to get your content up, but it's hard to get people to find it. Um, and really, you know, that leads to the second point, which is around curation. And so how do you find the right content for you? Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's all a personal taste based on quality and interest level. And uh, you know, I think I would argue that I think Facebook is probably doing the best job to date in terms of curation, just predominantly because they're basically curating it off of your friends, your friend list. Um, and I think that there's still a long way to go in terms of that curation model to really make it successful in the future. So in your mind, social is a critical component of discoverability? It's one part of it, yeah. I mean, there, there's various signals um, that, you, that you can use to identify that. Uh, when I was at Yahoo, we, we worked on um, uh, Launch, uh, which is sort of the original streaming music service. Um, and we used a variety of signals. So you think about the Spotify's and Pandora's today, it's really based off of this concept of uh, you know, what type of music do you enjoy listening to? And as you listen to you know, three or four tracks, you start to build a better uh, idea of what stations you'd want to listen to. And so I think that that, um, that model of curation where you're taking signals nowadays from social, from uh, uh, influencers in the marketplace, from bloggers, from uh, Snapchat is a great example, uh, and others. I think that that's going to be really critical in the future, um, alongside uh, just you know any trending topic. So, uh, you know, U.S. Women's World Cup wins in soccer. There's some great clips that will come up immediately. Um, if it's a top trending story, then that's interesting to you. Then that's something that should be a signal as well. Uh, Hanan, I want to ask you about your obviously you're an investor. Um, do you see a big difference between? The companies that are focused open web delivery um, services, etc., technology between those companies and companies that are delivering into regulated markets like the MDPDs. Do you think about them differently? Do you invest differently? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest difference is the companies that offer the open web move a lot faster. Right? I mean, that's ultimately. By the way, like one observation I'll make, I think we all, this whole panel is in agreement that like, we should bring the other commissioner from the disagreement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all, we all have the same philosophy. I would say um, technology solves, in this case, what regulation needed to solve in the last generation of technology. And I think that's kind of the observation that maybe you should stress to the rest of the folks you're trying to build consensus with because. Um, it all comes down to customer choice. It's all about creating you know, services, content that customers want to buy. And before it was about, hey, how does great content get distributed when you have these entities in the middle that have control over what gets distributed? But in an open platform, that's not a problem. So it's all about letting all content flourish. And, and you know, technologies reduce the cost of content creation. So we create a lot more content today. And it's all about solving discoverability and curation of the technology. So I don't know why the regulation needs to be the nose of whole thing anyways. So uh, let, me push on, let me push on that idea a little bit. Um, the power of incumbency is just as strong in the web, if not stronger. Right? I might, might argue it's a bit stronger than it has been in, in traditional delivery of, of particularly entertainment services, right? Um, an MVPD, if you can't, if you couldn't get on your local cable provider's service, 
you didn't have a business, right? Today, incumbency is a little bit different, but it is still there. Netflix, for example, is the must-have client on every single device. Um, and it looks like their growth is fairly unbounded at the moment. Um, and the web has this habit of anointing, I, I don't know how it happens, but we seem to end up with one dominant player in each area, in Google search, Amazon uh, for shopping, iTunes for music, etc. Is there a risk that somebody like Netflix could end up dominating the distribution of media in the US? And if you're not on Netflix, you don't exist? So I think uh, scale, which is what you're really talking about, is completing advantage. Look at Snapchat, for example. That company did not exist three years ago, and all of a sudden, it's got you know, hundreds of millions of uh, consumers got access to. It. So, but technology in some ways, the open platform has done its level to things. It's new platforms can emerge if they have a better proposition. To the extent that there are monopolistic platforms, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Facebook, I do think um, so. This whole idea of, I mean, I, I call this algorithmic accountability. So it's about then having algorithms that are fair, and Google gets uh, this sort of browse to them all the time around search and like which search you love, who loves pop up versus not. Same thing with Facebook, where those things are going to pop up in the stream. You know, uh, the, the extent that their algorithms are doing profit maximization, maximization at the uh, disadvantage of sort of a level playing field for a content creator, I think that's a problem. And I think that's a different set of issues that we should focus on to make sure that content creators are getting a fair and ubiquitous access. And, and to me, that's the contemporary regulation to the extent that it's needed or the best practices that are needed that we should think about rather than taking you know, sort of today's innovation and being into the old model, which doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. But I mean, if you go, if I can jump in for if you really look to you know, the sphere of like, okay, is one service going to dominate? I mean, if you look even like in recent history, Netflix, great, we all knew what it was, but I mean, it really wasn't distinguishable until House of Cards was there, right? So they're creating content, okay, great. That's that's what I'm watching Netflix for. Or you look at Amazon, until Transparent sort of emerged, it really didn't have that cachet of, okay, great, I've got Amazon. So again, going back to the content creator, I mean, it's, 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 it's are these platforms able to create and promote distinguishable content? And I think that's what, that is what helps to keep this economy, I think, balanced. Um, in terms of, aside from like, okay, I'm worried that Netflix is gonna dominate because it's unregulated. Well, I'm more concerned, like, okay, what are the opportunities I can make great content? And if it happens to, you know, there's there's some moment where you know your platform is making great content, you find the right content creator, and 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 then you know they can do that and flourish, fantastic. You know, so I, I do think that there 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 are other factors involved yeah. other than just sort of like you know exclusively market share and domination, but but there is this intangible idea of like okay quality of content. Right. Yeah. Uh, search, Dan, you, you, I'm glad you mentioned search because it's, it's an area that I find a little bit troubling actually. I, so I, I mentioned the incumbency is very powerful. Um, if you search on uh, Amazon's Fire TV platform, it's got beautiful voice search, yeah. it will find, it will understand you very easily and find what you're looking for, but only in Amazon services. But there are a whole bunch of other services available through that box. So th th that's an illustration, I think, of the power of incumbency to really squeeze out other content that might be a good solution to what somebody's looking for. Problem? Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a great point that you raise. Uh, and when you look at Amazon and um, you know even Apple to, to their Apple TV experience, I mean, everyone's trying to build this uh, sort of closed system, if you will, um, where uh, you can search for content, as long as you're on their platform, their technology, and they have the rights to that content. Um, and you know, Google, I think, was the best at this early on, where they really sort of focused on opening up the web uh, and allowing you to get content from anywhere. And so I think that that, um, that type of example needs to transform into the OTT space. Um, so uh, you know, when you think about uh, that technology burden, you've got a lot of large players on the TV manufacturing side. So, Samsung and LG pretty much lead the smart TV market. 
Um, and then you've got a lot of these other providers like Amazon Fire and Chromecast and Apple TV all coming up with their proprietary solutions. It's not really what the consumer wants. And, and I think longer term, you're, you're going to see a shift away from that um, towards services, hopefully, that uh, you know, similar to what we're doing, but, um, but really sort of create a ubiquitous standard where it doesn't matter if you want to use an iPhone or an Android or a tablet device. And if you, you know, prefer a Sony TV or Samsung, your content you're going to be able to play wherever you are. Um, that's really uh, where I think that the market needs to go. And, and uh, you know, in terms of, of how it relates to regulation, I mean, I would hope that um, there aren't market forces in the way that would prevent that from that technology from developing. Now, the troubling thing for me in, in this in this particular issue is um, I, I know a couple of startups who have uh, video services, and they tell me about the power of being on the first screen. If you're in the first screen, you get bound. Netflix always is. Amazon often is. Hulu often is. But many of the other, other services, Pop Netflix, probably isn't on the first page. Probably isn't found by many consumers. Um, this, this is a problem. Um, I mean, does it, does it raise to the level of requiring regulation? Well, I mean, I can take it real quick. It, it, I mean, it's, it's always better to be in the first spot uh, or the second spot. And even going back to traditional uh, you know, web, you always want to be above the fold. Uh, it was always a, a better placement. Um, but I think when you look at the overall marketplace, even right now for the boxes and for smart TVs, that usage is still relatively low. Um, so everyone's buying a smart TV because the costs have come way down. Um, but the percentage of people that are clicking on anything other than a Netflix, and even with that, it's still in the, the you know, low single digits to maybe you know, 12 to 15 percent, depending on which statistic you look at. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's necessary for regulation. I think it just shows the, the power of Netflix today. Um, that might change in the next two to three years. Indeed. Um, actually, I wanted to ask you, um, our market, let's keep it open free. Um, unregulated, but other markets are not like that. Is it fair to allow those markets unregulated open access to our market when we don't have the same with them? It's a good question. I think, uh, generally speaking, I'm hesitant to uh, I impose regulations that essentially require open access because ultimately it ends up being a case of a regulator uh, being a middleman uh, as these. Uh, as litigation, as negotiations break down. Uh, I, I tend to think that there has to be a concrete market problem to solve before uh, we try to solve it. And, uh, and also, if I can go back to the, the topic that was just discussed, I think that it's a really important point because it's something that we see over and over again. And this is ancient history now, but the government's invest the investigation of Microsoft in, context with the, in the context of Internet Explorer, the entire point there was something similar, right? You had Internet Explorer as the default browser so how would any consumer ever figure out to use another browser and crush Netscape or crush incipient uh, uh, browser competitors? But now we know how that debate has played out. As Hemoth, to borrow a point from Hemoth, technology solves the problem in a way that regulation either couldn't or could only do too late. And I, I have in my office uh, an article from the early 2000s by the AOL Time Warner merger that uh, people were urging the government to block this transaction because the consummation of it would, would lead the combined company to have an unbreakable monopoly over instant messaging. Just think about how, if the government had intervened in that case, what would the implications have been? I mean, there would have been a lot of unintended consequences, and we would have solved the problem that ultimately technology and consumers would have solved in concert. And so I'm generally hesitant to take a snapshot of the marketplace in a moment in time and assume that that marketplace is the way it's always going to be. Uh, there are a lot of uh, risks, I think, when the government gets involved uh, based on what it thinks is uh, happening at the moment. Additionally, uh, with respect to uh, uh, you know, some dominant providers and some non-dominant providers. I think Kevin raised a very interesting point, which I guess I would call the, sort of the field of dreams approach. If you create good content, then they will come. And it's almost as if, you know, given the way things become viral, and the way I found out from Crackle was through somebody I trust on my social media network and to somebody I follow on Twitter. And that's just a classic example. I've got to think that uh, the, the democratization of viewership, of innovation, is going to lead a lot of creators to be able to connect directly in ways in which it's unimaginable, it really is unimaginable a generation ago that you'd have the freedom to innovate in this way. You'd have to spend so much time negotiating with the gatekeepers instead of worrying about creating content. And so I guess in that environment, I'm a little hesitant to stick the government. It, 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 it seems like um, 
trying to regulate the Netflix. It, it's, it's a very different situation than with an MVPD, right? Because an MVPD is entirely local. Netflix is the biggest, becoming the biggest global distributor of content, right? So, how do you go about regulating that? That's, that's something that seems like it's something way, way bigger than just one company. I mean, as a general matter, I tend to think that ex post rather than ex ante regulation is the better way to go. And what I mean by that is instead of a preemptive regulation saying that they were, because of Netflix's potential dominance of other companies, uh, significant market strength, uh, we're going to regulate everybody in this industry according to X, Y, and Z rules. I would much rather take, uh, for example, an antitrust approach, which is to say, if the government has concrete evidence of an anti-competitive behavior, uh, Netflix is explicitly you know, pre precluding competitors from entering this space or is disadvantaging a particular program in a certain way that has a, that has a demonstrable effect, uh, then you know, the antitrust laws, Federal Trade Commission uh, regulations uh, are better suited to take care of that after the task in a more surgical, if you will, way. Um, as opposed to preemptive regulation that covers everybody from the Netflixes all the way down to uh, you know, the, the new entry the Netflix or doing something new. Right, yeah. right. I would also say, just on that point, I mean, when you look at something like a Twitter in terms of technology that's really connected the world in a way that didn't exist five to ten years ago, I think uh, mainly as a news source, um, you know, similar to Netflix in terms of, of its reach, uh, and probably even wider. Uh, but, you know, I think that uh, having that globalization of technology and content is generally a good thing um, for not just the U.S., but for other markets as well. So, uh, actually, K K Kevin, um, I wanted to ask you about one thing that uh, I've noticed is, 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 seems, seems to be happening is that China is actually beginning to regulate, if you like, some of the production of movies in the U.S. Because we have to make sure the, you, the Chinese market is too big to ignore. Um, so we make the movies differently so that they are saleable later in the Chinese market. Uh, are you seeing this? Uh, well, I'm asking this because I really want to see what the impact of regulation is on, on content. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, you know, that there's a moment where, you know, how, how much will you compromise creatively? You know, because, it's, uh, again, it's, it's can we get those dollars to fund the content? Can we monetize it within the territory? And look, it's China. It's, a, it's an international country or a foreign country. Everybody has their own cultural values and how they feel they need to work within the constraints of their own particular culture and whatever that history is. So there's no um, uh, uh, judgment on that. But it's okay, so how do we access that market? And certainly we're going to have to be malleable and change certain things and paint certain things as, as positive or not positive in order to, to be able to monetize it in that country, which I think is totally fair. Um, but it's a reality I think that's existed for a very long time. Right? So every, I mean, it just seems to like China find you know, it, it's just at the forefront, but I mean, there have been, you know, regulations in European television for years about what can and can't be broadcast or how, what, what kind of American content when and can be put on television or not. And so there, there's been a ton of regulation that's now just at the forefront because, you know, the, the, the economics of it, the, the globally, the, the globalization of how we just think of the world as, you know, one as opposed to many. And so I think there's other factors, but I don't think it's a new, it, 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 it's not a new influence on how we create content. It's just much more magnified. And Hamad, when you're looking at um, new startups, new startup opportunities, is that one of the? Uh, do you look at the regulatory environment for that technology or that market that is pointed at? Is that something that you take into con uh, concern when you're thinking about investment? Yeah, I, mean, I think uh, that's a complicated question. I, I would say. A lot of markets are regulated. If the, if the regulation is stable, then you don't care as much about it. You focus back on, hey, is, is this a place where the proposition is great for customers and can you build a company that can grow very fast? Uh, you know, if there's fluid regulation, you usually try not to touch those types of investments unless they were real keen on whether it's Airbnb, short investors, or Uber and whatnot. But, I, but in, in general, I, I, I will say that if you look at the last five, ten years, the kinds of companies that are getting funded, they're all touching regulation. You know, with the Affordable Care Act, the companies getting built, sort of health exchanges, we've invested in some of them. If you look at education, uh, you look at the world that's doing on energy, they all touch on energy regulation. So, so I mean, it's, 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 it's not sort of a simple answer as to do we always do this or not. In general, if we can avoid um, uh, regulated markets, we avoid them. Um, 
you, know, you, look, you were sort of bringing up Europe and China. There's a reason why the global platforms are all coming out of the U.S. because it's sort of born out of an open environment. And, and I do think in the end that always that's going to trump technology is always going to trump regulation. I mean, when you think about the next 20 years, and so uh, less regulation is better. <laughs> so um, uh, let's talk. Uh, let's talk a little bit about. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the way the FCC is, is thinking about implementing this regulation is on broadcast, uh, on, on that sort of format. And I, in, in the past, I wondered: Does broadcast really have a future online? Um, but there's one service in particular where it clearly does, and that's Twitch. Are you aware of Twitch? I don't know music. So, so Twitch is, I don't know if any of you are aware of it, um, Twitch was actually just recently purchased by Amazon for about a billion dollars. And what they do uh, is they allow gamers to broadcast their gaming. And um, kids use it like TV. I have a millennial in my home. <laughs> I wish I could get them. <laughs> they keep coming back. And this, my daughter is a gamer, and she uses it like television. So it's on for hours. Um, would this fall under the definition of an MVPD, they be regulated? That's kind of hard to find. I think it is, and I think that at the moment uh, what the FCC is thinking about doing is applying these regulations uh, only to subscription linear uh, offerings, and so, yeah, at the moment at least, your daughter is safe, so she won't be regulated by the agency, <laughs> but, but I think, as I said, once the camel's nose is under the tent, it's hard to distinguish, uh, it is, it's hard to rationalize why these regulations should apply to linear subscription providers, but not to others who are essentially competing in the same space with the transmission of video over a broadband connection is a transmission of video over a broadband connection, the business model sort of falls away as a relevant factor in terms of regulation. Over time, that would be the argument. Um, I think it's increasingly going to be a challenge, too, to think about how to even construe some of these services. I mean, Twitch, for example, or I, I use uh, Periscope and Meerkat a lot. It's with this user-generated live content that uh, is essentially broadcast. Uh, when you think about it, I mean, it's one to many over a wireless connection or a Wi-Fi connection. Um, yeah, how should we think about services like that? It seems to me there are a lot of benefits to it, uh, notwithstanding the waste of time it may be in individual cases. But uh, uh, but uh, the last thing I would want to do from a regulatory perspective is to preemptively look at some of these services as they're developing and try to shoehorn them into a category that was created by legislators you know, a generation ago. That just, uh, that, that's just terrifying and crazy. Yeah. Um, let me ask, I'm going to ask one more question before we go to the to audience questions. Um, so if you have a have a question and write it up and hand it to the ladies that are circulating in the audience. Um, are all regulations bad? Can we think of, I mean, <laughs> are there situations where we should regulate? I like that Absolutely. elevators all work well, and you know, <laughs> you know there's, there's regulations for safety. I mean, I think, uh, you know. What about kids, for example? I um, had <laughs> somebody complaining because their kids stumbled into, um, they were watching. I forget which show it was now, but it was, oh, Orange is the New Black. Now, I can tell you what, I don't want my young kids watching that show. Is that an area where we should have regulation on? Uh, I mean, uh, it, this is more of a philosophical issue, but I mean, I think, you know, it's a responsibility of families and parents specifically to make sure that they're raising their kids in the way that they want them to be raised. So, uh, you know, I mean, YouTube is a great exam. You can get anything on there. and. Yeah, there's YouTube Kids and other services, and I have a nine and six year old, so I'm facing you know similar issues around uh, everything. Uh, but I think it's really uh, you know a matter of, of how you're you're um, you know sort of controlling the home and the content. If kids want to get something, they're going to find a way to get it. Um, but uh, you know I don't think it's really the job of the government or regulators to try and um, you know uh, sort of restrict it before uh, you can actually even you know potentially access it. I was simply add that yeah, yeah. even if it were desirable as a policy matter, from a, as a legal matter, the, FCC, the agency, the, the government can't uh, regulate under the First Amendment uh, subscription platforms like uh, online video. It's, uh, these regulations apply traditionally to broadcast networks, and uh, even that model has been under uh, some legal screening in Washington. So. Mm -hmm. it's, 
It's a, as a parent myself, I, it's something I struggle with since uh, TV to my kids means an iPad with Sesame Street on it. So, uh, uh, but it's, uh, it's not something, unfortunately, that parents and uh, families will have to work out for themselves. Yeah. I know that's just one example, but you know, uh, like closed captioning, for example, which there has been some regulation on uh, in OTT video. Um, uh, maybe you could explain what that is. Um, that's, I think, probably a good thing because. I think one thing we've learned is that relying on companies to, to do the right thing is probably not going to work in all cases, <laughs> right? Right. Okay. So uh, the closed captioning example. So there is legislation uh, that relates to those with disabilities. It requires, in certain cases, uh, certain providers of video content to supply closed captioning. The theory being that we don't want to leave out a pretty significant segment of the population who want to enjoy this content as well. So the FCC over the last several years that I've had the privilege of being there has implemented this what's known as the 21st Century Communications Video Accessibility Act. And uh, those requirements are separate from the NVPD type regulations that we've been talking about. Uh, but uh, by and large, I think that it's, uh, that's a worthwhile endeavor I think that we should think about completely separately from you know, the MVPD regulations that I mentioned, because MVPD regulations are more wide-ranging, uh, less flexible, and less focused on the end consumer. It's more focused on just slapping a broad brush on everybody who is a video provider uh, under the Communications Act. Okay. So I'm now going to start uh, talking about some of the, reading out some of the questions here, and there's some good ones. Somebody write really small. Please <laughs> <laughs> write bigger. <laughs> My glasses are really <laughs> Uh, what role or impact do you see live content such as sporting events, real time we're talking about, and news playing in the OTT world, future of TV? I, sports are huge. I mean, there's a reason why everyone's paying billions of dollars for rights to, you know, I think the NFL is probably one of the most valuable franchises in the US, if not the world. Uh, and so, uh, you know, sports is going to be critical in the future, but. I love that uh, you know Yahoo I think announced a deal to, to show one of the NFL games streaming live, and uh, you know other players have, have started to get into the space. So uh, it's it's definitely it's going to be important in the future, uh, and you know I, I would love to see um, more uh, sports organizations um, start to sort of take the lead in terms of, of really providing better live streaming content. And uh, you know NCAA tournament for instance has been amazing. Um, so you know, I credit CBS and, and them for really pushing the envelope and making a lot of this content available. Um, similarly on the Masters, I'm a you know, golf fan, but, um, but yeah, but sports is large and important in my mind. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I'm excited about the possibility, but from a perspective, it's back from an infrastructure, I really want to make sure that, I mean, you have to have extremely robust networks in order to deliver uh, you know, high quality services. <laughs> Like that, and uh, you know, the Super Bowl is a paradigmatic example. I mean, how many millions of viewers? Uh, the one many broadcast model works for something like that. But uh, if we were to do that over the top, then I think it's critical for broadband networks to be uh, much more robust than they are today. Yeah, yeah. I noticed with the um, last Super Bowl that the live stream online was at times a minute behind the action. Right. Um, I could hear my neighbor cheering <laughs> before, before I saw it, which was not, not comfortable. Um, uh, how will the recent ruling on Filmon uh, uh, by a federal judge in Wood that Filmon should be treated like a traditional cable provider? It sounds like they've fallen into the same trap as Aereo, right? Yeah, so this uh, decision uh, from a federal district court in Los Angeles issued just yesterday uh, conflicts with a decision by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit in New York. Uh, which went the other direction. Uh, but what is critical to note is, number one, uh, the court maintained the injunction so that the law hasn't changed, notwithstanding the decision. And number two, the decision will be appealed to the Ninth Circuit. So as it stands today, uh, the law still is that the copyright issue remains a roadblock uh, for online providers. But it, it's, uh, it's, as the court mentioned yesterday, these issues are difficult, they're close, and so I think we can expect to see much more litigation in this area. Um, now, I'm, I may need the help of the writer of this. I'm going to read it, and you may need to clarify what you're exactly asking here. Uh, taking a page from Larry Lessig's book about code equals law regulation, what do you think about regulators regulating through engaging with companies uh, or entrepreneurs directly about concerns to influence the market and business? 
oh, and it continues over, oh, gosh, um, uh, business models instead of promulgating new regulations and uh, risk getting it wrong. Is that that's to me? Um, I, I get, well, it was asked open, but if you want to... Uh, is anyone else? As a general matter, I'm not a big fan of the government picking and choosing certain companies that uh, they would like to regulate and sitting them down in a closed environment and saying, it's a great business you've got there. It would be a shame if something had to happen to it. And nudging them in a certain direction. And we've seen this in the context of M&A activity, for example, where uh, the agency has to approve of a, a certain pr a transaction, and as a condition of approving it, it lasts for certain goodies, and I call it the Christmas tree effect, uh, which encourages companies to voluntarily agree to them. I have a number of concerns with that. Number one, when you know, regulatory uh, nudges like this aren't necessarily voluntary, but number two, if they're not trans transaction specific. And number three, if it, if it genuinely is a good idea for uh, a company to be regulated in such a way, then every other company that competes in a similar way to provide a similar product or service should be faced that same regulation. I, I'm not a big fan of the government picking and choosing certain players in the industry or certain segment of the industry and excluding everybody else because I think that ultimately that ends up creating all sorts of distortions in terms of you know, how you plan your business. Um, uh, you have, have, it, it makes Washington all the more critical and people start lobbying us for special favors. You know, and some of those favors take the, 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 take the shape of Please regulate my rival because they're doing something that I think is really, really bad, but don't regulate me. And that's, I would say, 80% of the meetings I have in my office are people trying to convince me of that. And, uh, I, as a general matter, either regulations apply to everybody or uh, they don't apply. That's the, the overall philosophy I take. Well, and on that note, too, I mean, it, you know, it's very public about Aereo, uh, you know, the push to essentially get them shut down. But I think what you're seeing now is a lot of those same players are now developing that Aereo technology. Um, yeah, so screen on right. Yeah. yeah, and so uh, you know, which it, it seems uh, a little bit hypocritical in, in my mind. So I think either either let everybody play, or you know, uh, just make it a fair playing field. Exactly. Um, so. Um, so we haven't talked about movies, and somebody has asked, uh, I think, a good a good question about movies, um, and it, they're really asking. Uh, kind of, can the panel, Commissioner Pine, comment on the structure of the movie industry where studios are releasing films um, totally, I can't quite read that word, exhibitors. Um, the theaters, uh, to display first run content, there are release windows that foreclose online competition, especially with new releases. What should the FCC do to look at the structure of the movie industry to advance online streaming? And in, in fact, um, I, I don't know uh, if any of you had a chance to listen to Netflix um, when they gave their financial briefings uh, earlier this week. Um, th they made a very interesting statement. That they have a quite an anti antagonistic relationship with the movie industry. Um, and uh, they are releasing new movies day and day with theater releases and they look, they're looking to theaters simply to provide um, legis legitimacy that what they're releasing is a movie and not really for profit. Um, is, there a, is there a problem here? Kevin, I mean, why don't you? No, I mean, I think it's like a practical economic function. I mean, I don't think it's antagonistic at all. I think it's, you know, I mean, for the last, you know, 100 years, you know, in a sense, movie that that's, that a movie has been defined by, you know, first introducing to the culture of the theatrical experience. But there have been a lot of examples where a cosmetic theatrical has created value for the content and ancillary revenue, and ancillary uh, streams down the road. So I don't think this is a new thing that Netflix is doing. You know, a lot of us have been doing it for a lot of companies have been doing it for a very long time. And again, it's just magnified now for whatever reason because of this point of you know this of technology and and content, et cetera, and that's the discussion. Um, so I mean, I think it's a pure economic issue, right? So there are so many choices, there are so many platforms, that's great. So again, how do I make my content distinguishable? How do I get my content to create awareness? How do I discover the content? How do I market the content? So again, all of these uh, methods of windowing and, and uh, merchandising, I think are just really relevant to like the pure economics of how do I monetize best my content. Well, so, yes, sorry, go ahead, if, if you think from first principles, the reality is the need for movie theaters isn't really there anymore. Like, why do we need them? We can get a popcorn machine in our own house, we have big screens, and it should just be they should all be online. 
like I think it's, a, it's an old industry that, again, as you sort of forward project 10, 20 years, people really want to go to the theater to see movies. I mean, why shouldn't that, why is that a, a live scheduled activity? I mean, certainly from, from Netflix from Netflix perspective, when you when you think about they're one of the first people to provide ultra HD content. Um, so projecting an ultra HD movie from Netflix is going to be a great experience. Um, so there is there's something to what you say. But um, movie industry is that something that that, that you've looked at? Uh, for better or worse, the FCC doesn't have any authority to regulate this in this particular area, so I haven't uh, spent a lot of time looking at it from a, using my commissioner's hat. Uh, as a consumer, what I can say is that I increasingly view the term movie as somewhat um, outdated. And what I mean by that is that um, the question from, for the consumer is not, should I walk, go to a movie theater and watch, spend two hours watching a film, or should I stay at home and watch a broadcast television network? The, quite, the content is the content, and especially now where we have a lot of original series where you know, the narrative arc traverses an entire season, not just you know, a self-contained episode. I think a lot of people, I don't know, speaking for myself, I view in a lot of ways series like The Americans as almost a substitute for a movie that I would have seen in the theater a generation ago. And so I increasingly think in addition to what Hemant said about you know, the place where you watch content and the way that you watch it, I think the very meaning of movie is changing, and so that's uh, something as a consumer that I've found over the years has been uh, very appealing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's remarkable to me that people will actually watch full-length movies on their cell phones, and yet I see it all the time. Yeah. Um, uh, Kevin, is this, is this uh, something that you think about? Um, um, by the way, did you, was Giroud, was that released in theaters as yeah, well? Yeah, Giroud's in the sushi. I mean, this is, I mean, Netflix existed, but I would call this kind of like a pre-Netflix world. Four, four years ago. Four. 2012, so you know that's a, a traditional theatrical release. But I mean, I think to your point though, I think Jiro from the sushi if it were released today, it would have to fall. I, I think it would follow a similar pattern of going theatrical first because there is this consciousness, the shared consciousness. Okay, we see we see a movie together, we talk about it, we experience it. You know, we rally around a Thursday evening or whatnot because there's a fixed time to watch it, and then that creates the word now. So I mean, I think that there's all these. I, I think the the concept of going to the movies maybe slightly anachronous, but I still think it works for a certain kind of content, right? And again, I think to your point earlier about curation, consumers want curated content to some degree. So if uh, Warner Brothers says that this franchise is worth spending $200 million on and will market it, put it out in theaters, then that's going to have an impact on consumers. They say, okay, great, that's worthy of my $10, $15, $20, you know, taking my family out, spending three hours that evening, and that's going to be the experience. So, you know, I, I think it's just that there's still relevancy, I think, to every uh, form of distribution. It's just, you know, is the content appropriate for that particular platform? So it sounds like you, you're you differing a little bit with Command and that you do think movie theaters have a future? I do. I mean, not in the way that they have historically, but I mean, I think that in the way that, you know, movie theaters have a future in the way that Meerkat has a future, right? So that there, there are all these shifting things, and I think that everyone is still going to find how they want to consume their content, where, I mean, sometimes I like to go to movie theater, sometimes I like to watch on my phone, and you know, sometimes I'll watch on my computer, and it, it's just, it, what's my mood, what, what, how much time do I have, what's efficient, do I want to do something solo, do I want to do something with friends? So there are so many different factors, you know, in terms of that, and I think it's great, because we have so many different options, I have a myriad of ways that I can consume my content and, and enjoy it, and, 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 and enjoy it in different ways in each experience. And well, I'd say going, yes. I th I mean, going back historically too, uh, you know, with the advent of TV in the 1940s, 1950s, there was a fear from exhibitors and movie theaters that they would go out of business, right? Why would you ever go to a theater again if you can experience it at home? Um, and then similarly, when you know, VHS and then DVD and, and others came out, there's always, as technology evolves, and, and to your point earlier, it's, um, there's a fear from the existing establishment and the industry around that. But what we've seen specifically on the content side, and music is a great example of this as well as video, is that um, the content only grows, right? The, the viewership and the time that people spend watching or listening to, to this content, it increases. So um, I definitely I see your point about not necessarily uh, wanting or you know, not going to the theaters in the future. I think the exhibitors need to create that better experience, which uh, in a lot of ways they're already doing in terms of better seating, food options, and other things to really make it more of a, um, a complete experience. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, 
I do think that they will exist, but they're going to exist in tandem um, with being able to really just, you know, if you want to watch it at home, day and date, great. Uh, you know, and I think it's just figuring out what that right model looks like. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's going to work out well for the consumers in my mind. Okay. Um, and, and I'm glad, actually, that um, uh, Kevin, I think you mentioned Meerkat. Um, we didn't talk about Meerkat Periscope. Um, these are these uh, live broadcast apps, so you can broadcast what's going on around you from your phone directly. <coughs> um, are there concerns with these types of services that might lead us to regulation of those types of services? I mean, for sure, there are privacy issues, right? So certainly, uh, using the Pacquiao Mayweather fight that recently happened as an example, uh, there you had a number of people live streaming uh, the fight, which was otherwise $100, I believe it was, for uh, pay-per-view. So the difficult uh, copyright questions are going to have to be confronted by uh, the people who have the rights to broadcast some of that content. Uh, that's beyond the FCC's bailiwick, but I think um, one of the interesting things from a consumer perspective is going to be how do companies that have the rights to broadcast, say, an NFL game, try to incorporate, or do they try to incorporate uh, services like Periscope and Meerkat so that you might have, for example, uh, as I was saying earlier, a member of New England Patriots with a, a smartphone on the sidelines capturing Tom Brady cursing at his offensive lineman or something like that, and you would have that as an adjunct to the overall broadcast. Could that provide value uh, to you know, the relevant broadcaster, CBS, uh, NBC, or whoever it is? Or do they think that it's uh, more of a distraction that you just risk opening up the door to um, you know, losing a lot of the control, so to speak, over how that content is distributed? Uh, that, that's a really challenging question that I don't tend to be uh, some of the people who hold these uh, these rights uh, to figure out. So, Kevin, does, would it bother you if somebody was um, uh, using Periscope to broadcast one of your photo shoots without your permission? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's the key, right? It's permission, right? So, how do you create a better experience for the consumer? And I think there's the opportunity to with all of all of the technology at hand. But again, if it's it's got to be an open dialogue. It's got to be legal, right? So, there are there, there are issues of legality that I think, you know, in copyright and whatnot, that I still like just sort of basic moral principles that have to be adhered to, and then we can build around that. Okay. Well, I uh, think we're just about out of time, so I want to thank everybody for, first of all, thank you for your great questions, uh, and thank you panelists for your great feedback on this fascinating issue. This is clearly something we are going to be talking about for a very long time. <laughs>